The French and Indian War was a large leap into American history. Had the course of the war changed, the United States very well might not exist, or at least have been much smaller. The harsh seasons on the edge of two major waterways was just a small obstacle for the French. The placement of Fort Niagara was ideal for anyone looking to have control of a great waterway. Water and land were gold mines for both the French and the British when it came to hosting armies. Many battles took place on Fort Niagara's grounds in order to keep control of the major waterways, the Niagara River and Lake Ontario. Old Fort Niagara has seen war, death, and destruction, now sitting in New York State Park in historical Youngstown, New York. In 1725, the French met with a delegation of Iroquois natives at Onondaga, which was the central town of the Five Nations. Plans for trading grounds were established, and in 1726, the French built the French Castle, with intentions other than trading. Later, in July of the year 1759, the British fought a long and hard battle and ultimately seized Fort Niagara. The British occupied all throughout the American Revolution until the land was handed over to the United States after the signing of the Jay Treaty in 1796. But how did the soldiers live during the age of no electricity and a rarity in supplies? Fort Niagara was originally a wilderness fort, with the closest town being seven and a half miles away. The French built the main fortress, however, long after the British took hold of it, they added many buildings and shops to create a private village for convenience of many who lived there. Uh, typically, the supplies of the soldiers were shipped over from Europe. Fort Niagara was really um, the depot, and it was, you know, pretty much the place where all the ships would come, drop off all of their stuff, and then from here, uh, they would send all of their stuff throughout to the other wilderness forts. Um, typically, uh, you would have come with whatever you have, and this is during the French time. Uh, there was no tavern down by the, the lakeside or anything. Um, so. You typically just have to survive with whatever you have. Um, as far as uh, food and everything, everything was provided for you. They had to keep you alive and uh, happy, so they would provide, of course, um, stuff to drink uh, because the water wasn't incredibly good to drink. Uh, so they would provide, uh, officers would be receiving brandy, um, some of the soldiers would be receiving rum, um, anything like that. So uh, really supplies was kind of limited here. Um, it wasn't really uh, vast until the American and British were here. Strategically, Fort Niagara was at the epicenter of the storm that was the French and Indian War, a vital link in New France's efforts to maintain the integrity of its lines of communication between Montreal, the Mississippi River, and Louisiana. Benson and Tolk, Waterways of War. Uh, specifically, mail service at the fort was very limited. Most soldiers were illiterate. They could not read or write. Uh, typically, only officers were able to really send mail to whomever they needed it to. Uh, probably other officers at different command posts or their higher ups in, uh, say, Quebec. Um, but typically, like I said, soldiers were illiterate, so they can't read or write anyway. Um, you do see accounts of musicians uh, because they were illiterate. Uh, musicians helping them keep diaries and such, but really there was no mail service for the common soldier here. The French and British soldiers practically had the same lifestyle while occupying Fort Niagara, with minor differences. The food was very similar because it was cheap and convenient. Well, typically you received a ration of salt pork, whole yellow peas, and uh, you would receive a six pound loaf of bread every few days. Uh, so you would typically take all of that food and you would mix it up into a giant garrison pot, which basically means you make a giant pea stew every single day. Uh, now typically you make the stew twice a day, uh, first time in the morning, uh, or more afternoon time, and this would be your midday meal. Uh, then you would eat it cold, because you don't want to waste the firewood, uh, later in the day. And this is where the British actually make up the nursery rhyme. Peas porch hot, peas porch cold, peas porch in the pot nine days old. Um, it's actually a complaint by the British soldiers, complaining that they have to eat the same thing twice a day, every day. Uh, the whole nine days old part, well, you're using the same pot. So, all the food gets caked onto it because you're not cleaning the pot every single time you make the food. And so you basically take all the gunk at the bottom of the uh, pot, scrape it all out, let it dry in the sun, and you have a nice peas porridge breakfast bar. 
The uniforms were different but had similar purposes. Soldiers wore bright colored uniforms for the purpose of differentiating between allies and enemies. The muskets commonly used for warfare on both sides, including natives, were flintlock smoothbore muskets. The firing of these muskets creates a large amount of smoke which blinds soldiers from shooting at their enemies across the battlefield. Uh, well, typically in the 18th century battlefield, you want nice bright uniforms. But you think, hey, that's kind of silly wearing a nice bright uniform when you're trying to avoid being shot. Well, really, you're, uh, the whole goal with the 18th century warfare is stand in long lines and take turns shooting at each other. You know your enemy is 100 yards that way. You have no problem aiming that way and hoping you hit something because it's the very, very, very inaccurate weapons. So typically, with these long lines, you're again just pointing and hoping you hit them. And what happens is all of the smoke builds up on the battlefield, uh, bringing to what's called the fog of war. Uh, now that uh, pretty much builds up and builds up and builds up, and you can't even see your friends anymore. Now that can be sort of an issue because you're probably more worried about people behind you, about 30 yards behind you, that can actually hit you, as opposed to the people 100 yards away that probably have no chance of hitting you. So you uh, really just want to wear the nice bright uniforms to avoid friendly fire. The British, you'll see, have these huge facings on their coats and everything, uh, the tight cuffs around. But the French are still wearing these huge coats with the giant boot cuffs and their flowing coats, huge tails and everything. And the British have very tight uniforms and very uh, fitted to them. Let's say, if we're in the 1750s, the British are wearing the 1750s fashion, as opposed to the French wearing maybe 1730s fashion. Now, I am wearing red, and I am in fact a French soldier, uh, which tells you that I am part of the uh, Marines because I'm also wearing red breeches underneath. Um, the whole issue with that is we are wearing these bright, uh, big coats on top of it, you know, showing what regiment we're part of with that, and you really don't need to worry about the underclothes because red is just a very cheap dye. So, that kind of uh, gives you an idea of what the British and French would have been wearing as far as colors and clothing wise. Like every soldier, these men had chores and duties. They had to work hard at drills, chop up firewood for survival in a wilderness fort, and much more. The soldiers would know what time of day it was, or what duty to perform, by the musician's call. For example, a reveille call would be performed to wake the soldiers. off duty as a guard. What happens is you wake up uh, pretty much when the sun comes up. Uh, you'll have the musicians playing the reveille call and then basically uh, you go through drill, you go through whatever uh, you really need to as far as getting water, digging trenches, uh, building the walls at the fort, uh, pretty much anything like that. Uh, and drill typically would last anywhere from one to three hours and then after that you're pretty much just working all day. Uh, now, if you were on guard, uh, you have what is called guard duty, and you serve on guard duty for 24 hours. And what happens is you sit in the guard room in full uniform, and you can do whatever you want. You can eat, sleep, drink, smoke, gamble, again, anything, as long as you stayed in your full uniform and were ready to go at a moment's notice. The regular firing of a musket was a lengthy process. An army's best shooter could only get four shots in a minute with the inaccurate musket of that day and age. The bayonet was the most dangerous weapon of the time. Based on its long, dull blade, the bayonet would not only stab but leave the flesh tattered and torn as it would exit the body. The triangular shape that the bayonet has would leave it nearly impossible to sew up, ultimately leading the wounded soldiers to death. Sit on Buttermilk Hill. Who can blame me? Fort Niagara has been active for centuries, but is now retired and used for historic educational purposes in Youngstown, New York. It has been occupied by the French, British, and the Americans and seen war, death, and destruction. Old Fort Niagara now receives over 100,000 visitors annually from all over the world. Many officers and soldiers alike have left their stories in this place. These stories are still told today by reenactors at the fort. They portray life and death of soldiers and everything in between. On these grounds was a struggle for a continent. When visitors enter today, 
They are living in history, which provides a real connection to the past. Johnny has gone for a soldier With fife and drum He marched away He would not heed what I did say He'll not come back for many a day Johnny has gone for a soldier Oh my baby, oh my love Your father was my own Johnny has gone for a soul.